guys, welcome back to Watch Gauge. This video is gonna be a little bit different than anything I've done before. Uh, it's not gonna really be about Watch Gauge's brands, the watches that we sell, or anything of that nature. This is going to be about uh, a kind of an inside peek of a watch industry event that myself and a bunch of friends went to and ran into a bunch of more friends. Kind of give you guys an inside peek at, at some of the behind the scenes events and things like that. We're gonna be doing a lot more of these in the future. Before I get into that, um, quick wrist watch check. I am wearing the Stratton Synchro 40 millimeter absolutely love this watch um, just started carrying them on watch gauge a couple weeks ago go check out the brand on watchgauge.com so what's gonna make this even a bit more um, of a different type of video is before this event I went to on Friday uh, it was a Bremont townhouse event uh, but beforehand I got my wife tickets for her birthday to see Tyler Farr. For those of you who aren't country music fans, country rock fans, you may want to fast forward the video until I start getting into watches. I'm going to show you a couple of things from Thursday night. So I'm friendly with, uh, with Gary Janneman of Tyler Farr's band. He's the lead guitarist. When you see the pictures, he's the guy with the crazy mohawk. Couldn't be a nicer dude in the world. I, he's if, in the world, he's the nicest dude. Um, so I texted Gary a couple weeks ago and saying, hey, when you guys are on Long Island, I got tickets to see a show. I'm looking forward to seeing you. So he, he texted back and said, dude, let's get a beer before the show. So my wife and I met Gary for a beer before the show at a pub real close to the venue. We went and saw the show. He got us meet and greet. So check out the picture of the meet and greet. And then after the show, um, we were about to get in the car. He said, where are you guys? I said, we're, we're on our way home. And he said, dude, you gotta come back to the tour bus. So I said to my wife, when do we ever get to go on a rockers tour bus? So we ended up going back to the tour bus. It was my wife, myself, Gary, Tyler, and the rest of the band for about an hour hanging out. Thank you guys so much. It was a night to remember and it was tons and tons of fun. Check out, I have to show, I have to show you a couple of clips from the concert itself. Absolutely amazing, check these out. These guys were such gentlemen. What a great time. We had a ton of fun. I cannot wait to do it again. Thanks again, guys.
So by the time I got home from the concert, it was probably 12, 30, 1 o'clock, by the time my adrenaline uh, simmered down, uh, it was probably 1.30, and then I had to be up on a, at about 5 o'clock for a uh, 6 a.m. train to New York City to go hang out with my buddies at Braemont. We had gotten the invite a few weeks ago, and I was speaking with my friends over at the Urban Gentry who also got the invite, and we all decided, hey, we have to go together. So Eight hours ago, I was hanging out on a tour bus with a couple country rockers, which was pretty awesome. And uh, here I am, Madison Square Garden behind me, and uh, Empire State Building in front of me, and going to have an awesome time uh, hanging out with the guys from Braemont today, and Urban Gentry, and all the other people that show up, and uh, only in New York. Keep watching. So with a lack of sleep and still running on a bit of adrenaline, I took a two and a half mile morning walk from Penn Station in New York down to Soho, which is just over two miles or so. Once we all finally arrived at the Braemont townhouse, a giant screen dropped from the ceiling and a, a promo video for Braemont uh, started to play. And after the video, Braemont co-founder Giles English got up and gave us an uh, introduction to the new pieces, some bit about Braemont. It was very, very interesting. Take a quick peek. Um, uh, but no, thank you. Welcome here. This is what, what this whole house is. It's our townhouse. And every year we launch new collection of watches. And historically, it always used to be done at Basel. Basel the big watch fair. And two years ago, uh, well, three years ago, we were at Basel, and we thought, actually, this, is, this isn't what Brent was about. This sort of, you're in a sort of flappy tent in Switzerland. Uh, they refused to put us in the brochure because we were an English watch company. So we're paying all this money to be in Basel, they wouldn't even put you in the brochure. And we just thought, actually, we've had enough of this. Uh, let's get everyone let's, to come and experience what Brent was about. And we're a British watch company. So we hired out a townhouse in London and put that all together uh, and flew people in. Uh, and it's all about retailers, VIPs and press, basically. And, and, uh, and it's a really lovely way to connect and come and feel the Bremen world uh, for a few hours or in the evening. And, and then this year, I'm doing it just in London. This is our New York version. It will be small places in and after a few minutes of speaking, he was kind enough to open up the floor to questions. I've spoken for far too long, but yeah. But any questions? Yeah, have you have you have you guys ever taken time to sit back and say, "Holy crap! This look how much we've done in the last what 15 years." Do you know it's quite odd because you think you should, and and actually there's there's the natural thing is to say this is great, but actually. When you're investing so much in manufacturing, it's a constant dark hole of, we call it the fuck it fund, because that's just, <laughs> you're literally pouring money. So we, so we don't feel we've got there. Yes, we're, we're quite big now around the world, but we're just, we're so much more ambitious about, and it, it you know, and you employ people, you've got to employ more people, and so you've got to pay their wages. And, um, so it's, yes, it's very exciting, and what we've learned, from Ben Saunders, it's an amazing story. This, and I leave you this one point to take away. And I, what Nick and I have to keep telling ourselves is, Ben Saunders spent ten years raising the funds to go do his Scott trip. Raised it three months walking, crossed the line, and when he got back from uh, South Pole, I'd never seen someone whose glint in his eye gone. It took him about a year and a half to actually get colour in his eyes back. And it was that almost disappointment. He'd spent 10 years, crossed the line, now what? And he just said, this is the biggest lesson for me, it's about enjoying the journey. It's not the destination, it's that journey. 
and, and it's so true. In life, you've got to enjoy every day, every little success, enjoy that journey. Because that destination is, you, there's a cliff at the end of that destination. So, um, uh, so I think it's, it's a very good point. You really have to enjoy it and yeah. make the most of everything. And, and, uh, and but you highs and lows and stresses and strains. And um, it, I think everyone, it's very easy to think, you know, watch companies, you see the marketing the front end. We're an engineering company making something which is, you know, we're machining stuff three microns. The human hair is 50 microns. So the machines, I go, I've got four and one people and gun manufacturers who work for me in our machine shop. We have to retrain these guys because they've never machined anything to that level before. So you're, and, and when you, you add up all these components in together and it's, it's, it's a hell of a complicated thing. So we're an engineering business. We have to sell globally, so we have we have our own shops around the world, and you have to market be brilliant marketeers. So it's a really complicated business. You're sort of juggling. Do you wake up thinking about a prison that you've got to do, or or about buying some new drill bits that <laughs> keep churning through because you've got the wrong spindle speed? So you know every three cases you have to replace your drill heads, and so you, that sort of issue right. um, so yeah it's it's a challenging one it's very impressive how far are you from let's say manufacturing an actual watch in the UK I know that's been discussed before yeah so we're interesting about 75% of our cost base for a watch is UK so mm -hmm. and we're doing movement bits what we don't do is full movement in the UK um, and you'll never do 100% ever because no watch company yeah. does 100% of the components it's just impossible because there's certain things, unless I'm making five million or a million certain screws, there's no point in investing in that machinery. But what we started on this exercise, we wanted this British movement. And, then, and we started that four years ago with an amazing guy called Stephen McDonald. And, and I got this call one day, and I had known Stephen McDonald. He was um, he's an Irish guy who uh, studied at Oxford. Um, in his spare time and holidays, he used to go and work in the local retailer mending broken watches. Um, came out of Oxford, went to Wastem to go and train as a watchmaker in Switzerland. At the end of it, they offered him a professorship in complications. Uh, uh, went on to Christopher Clary, Harry Winston, all these different people. And then his last big project was the perpetual calendar for MBNF. So the first guy who redesigned the perpetual calendar for many, many years. And the guy's a genius. But not only does he design it all the CAD, he hand builds the prototypes. So this guy is an amazing machinist and the most of So genius, and I've known him, he's a Brit, so over the years, and sort of, you know, I got a call about four years ago, and he said, look, I can't stand another day in Switzerland. I've got to get out of this place. Do you have a job? And, and it's a bit like, you know, I don't know. Bill Gates calling up saying, Can I come work for you in your software? <laughs> <laughs> um, so so we, we said, Yeah, of course. And uh, he came and joined us, and with this beautiful movement that we inspect his designs, we've gone for patents for it, uh, finished design uh, June last year, and now we're prototyping it. But there's probably another two years to come out. But it's, uh, that's, uh, June, it's a really exciting project. And, and it's not. You have a design, you have a movement, but you're also in the whole process, you're, you've spent years prototyping components, so can you, by the time you're ready for that to deliver it, can you actually do the finish, can you do the engraving, Geneva stripes, large? can you machine it? If I'm doing 10 or something, it's bloody easy to build, because it's all about hand doing it. If I'm making 500,000, your machine, for example, if that machine drill head or anything varies, um, uh, if there is any heat changes, your, your tolerance has changed. So your machine you need for doing 10 watches can be far cheaper if I'm doing 1,000 watches because there can be no variation because it's not, it, it, you know, if you're hand building, you put together it doesn't work, or you chuck that base plate away and you machine a new one so it does, and that's why it can take you a year to build a watch if you're selling that watch for 200 grand or something. 
mine has to be right every single time if I'm going to do it on a mass production. So it's a very different game building these in big numbers than small numbers. And so all of that investment has to go into as well. And really, to justify what we're doing to see in our case manufacturing, we probably need to do 30,000 watts a year to justify that investment. But, but we have to do it in the UK. So if I go and get a case made in Switzerland, all the case manufacturers are owned by the big groups. Rich Moss, Swatch, LVMH. So I go to them and go, yeah, yeah, we'll take the business. They say it's going to be nine months to deliver the case. Nine months it comes, and they go, well, actually, sorry, we're a bit late. Uh, it's going to be another three months. It's come on Christmas business. How do I yeah. deliver? So we're completely beholden to other people. So that's why we have to, we have to do that stuff ourselves. Makes sense. If I had something like a GMT Master that has that quick set hour hand, yeah, I would be much more likely to, to change my main hands. To, and I would probably set this to all the time because that's when I have to be at work. Yeah. I have to be at the airport at the end of the time. Um, so that's probably the style I would do that if I had something. Which watch is, which GMT is this? This is the MB3. Oh, okay. MB3, we got you know, your hands. Basically, the only difference from MB3 to MB2 with the GMT end is about four wheels, okay. four extra wheels. So you have your regular hour wheel that goes on all the all the watches, but this hour wheel has a double wheel underneath. So there's two gears, and then these this will basically quick set your GMT hand. This will run into the hour hand, and this is the extra hour hand with a wider base that will fit on that GMT. Hand. So it's a very, it's a very good complication. Twenty eight ninety three variation. I mean, this is a workhorse. Of a little bit. Bloody hell! Don't anyone sneeze. <laughs> yeah. it's not, it's not so I mean, it's it's excellent. Very. I mean, again, it's small. Look at. I mean, you oh, see the size. It's not a hole in the paper. That's a <laughs> <laughs> Those are screws. Yeah. Holy crap! Yep. Back service. Pick up They'll service it. We're on the roof of the Bremont townhouse. I've been told by Adam from Red Bar that I must go all the way up. What's really fascinating is that Bremont does limited editions specifically for military squadrons and special forces around the world. Here are some of the dials from those special pieces.
long and epic Friday. Uh, fantastic guys, fantastic people. Uh, Braymont, uh, Red Bar people, well, everybody just Urban Gentry, great time. Can't wait to do it again. On the train home, about to go enjoy the weekend with the family. So I hope you guys enjoyed that video. I had an absolutely amazing time. It was, uh, it's what dreams are made of. When people ask me, hey, how are you doing? My automatic response is living the dream. To be able to hang out with some rock stars, to go to watch events, uh, is exactly what I could ever ask for. So uh, I'm living the dream. I hope you guys are too. It was amazing to get to hang out with the guys from Braymont, the Urban Gentry, Adam from Red Bar, Rob Velasquez, uh, Spanish Rob, great to finally meet you in person. We had such an amazing time. I, we plan on doing a lot more of these things together, uh, particularly with the Gentry guys, uh, my good friends. So stay tuned. Check out The Urban Gentry. I'm sure you all subscribed to him already, uh, but check that out because there's gonna be uh, a follow-up video on The Urban Gentry at some point in the future when TGV gets to edit it. So thank you guys for everything. New brand coming to Watch Gauge either this week or the beginning of next week, so stay tuned. And uh, as always, like, share, comment, subscribe, all that fun stuff. Um, we have our Facebook page, we have our Instagram. The more support I get from you guys, the more of this fun stuff I'm gonna be able to do. And thank you guys so much for everything, and we'll get you on the next one.